Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston. I'm Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Supporting Children with, additional, with English as an Additional Language. Um, I am joined today by Isabel Rattislaw, Lindsay Weston, and Sean Ansell from our Better Start South End team. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Um, the, for those of you who are new to our webinars, um, hopefully you can see the screen, which is the introduction one, which has our job titles um, and um, introduces ourselves. And if I press this button, it's going to move around to a different one. I'm on the different slide here, um, which gives you the structure of the sessions. Hopefully that has moved across and you'll be able to follow us in there. For those of you who are daunted by the idea of a webinar, please don't be. It's normal to a seminar, but we deliver them on the web. This allows us to reach a lot more people at one go um, and hopefully makes for an interactive discussion with the ability for people to respond with questions and comments as we go forward. Um, we, will, we have a presentation of about 30 to 40 minutes uh, and we do allow 15 to 20 minutes for questions and comments. But uh, for those of you who've been with us before, um, please don't wait, then you'll know not to wait to the end to ask any comments. You might forget and I, uh, the technology might go down, anything might happen. If you have any comments you wish to make, uh, you should see that there is a little speech box on the side of your, uh, on this toolkit that opened up when you logged into the webinar. You can type your question or comment into that box. It only pops up on my screen. Hopefully, no, it does. Um, and so I can then weave that into the conversation as best I can. Um, nobody else will see your question, um, and hopefully we will be able to answer them on the spot. There's been a few times when we had to go away and research, but we always um, manage to get in touch with the people as a result. Um, from that point, I'm just. Um, I will hand over to, I'm going to Isabel in the first instance. Come on, yes, thank you. So today, hello everybody. Today we're looking at um, English as an additional language and we're covering three different areas. So we're looking at language development with children who may be learning English as an additional language. We're looking at how those children and their parents might feel coming into an earlier setting. And then thirdly, we're looking at ways that uh, you may help and support those parents and children within the setting. And so why are we doing it? Well, here is a quote from the statutory framework that you can all read. I have a question. It was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, it's a question for everybody who's listening. Um, there is a reference to the primary national strategies document on the left hand side. And whether you're going to go into any detail on this, it'll be interesting. But no Googling. What year do you think that was published? Um, I did cheat before we came on air, but it'll be interesting to see. I'll see who, who comes up with the right answer. Um, anybody out there listening, please, what year, take a guess, did the Primary National Strategies launch supporting children children learning English as an additional language? They're looking confused in the office here. 2009 from Gillian, 2013 from Cassandra, 2007 Sharon, um, I'll just give you a second or two more. Um, everybody in this office is looking a bit confused. 2016 from uh, Louise, Kaylee's 2017. Um, Sharon, you're correct, 2007. It is, it is 12 years old. Um, it's fascinating. Anyway. Is it? And every word still absolutely resonates. Um, it is interesting, I also checked, it's archived on the DFE, so it's probably more difficult to get hold of now. Anyway, this one. Next slide, please. So, uh, continuing why we're focusing on EAL today, um, as you can see, there's three reasons there, um, but very interestingly, considering we're saying that that document is 2007, 
that um, nowadays one in five primary school yeah. children don't speak English as their mother tongue, and this proportion is up by 50% in a decade. Wow. So, wow. you know, there's, there's an ever-increasing reason why we need to focus on EAL and how uh, we help and support those children. Um, and really, the minority of people, uh, we, uh, we as monolingual speakers are in the minority in the world. Uh, there are far more people in the world who have two languages than those with just one. Um, and there are real benefits to being multilingual. It, it's quite a, a privilege to be multilingual. Yeah, and um, research has shown that uh, cases of early onset of dementia is lower in multilingual people. So there's always a chance, Michael, for us. Well, I'll, I'll be practicing my German as we were before. Exactly. <laughs> before we, we can learn another language and really challenge our brain in later life with continuous native connection, which is part of the theory why, but we don't really know. But yeah, really interesting. Okay, so it's really important that that we, um, before we really start on this webinar, that we understand that there is a difference between children who are learning English as an additional language and children who are bilingual. So today we're going to use the term home language to refer to the language or languages that the family use at home. So EAL, it's sometimes referred to another term that we use for this, and this is successive bilingualism. So this occurs when a child learns a second language after their first language has been established. And they can often go through several stages of language development, which we'll explore later in the webinar. And then being bilingual, or trilingual, or even multilingual, sometimes referred to as simultaneous bilingualism. So you have successive bilingualism, simultaneous bilingualism. And this occurs when a child's learning and developing two different languages at the same time because he or she is exposed to both languages and has frequent opportunities to practice both languages. And children who are acquiring two languages simultaneously go through three phases of language development. So this, these are families where you may have um, a, a French parent and an English parent, or you might have French and Spanish, you might have Polish and Portuguese, or Polish and English, it doesn't really matter what the combo is, but that child is being spoken to right from the day they're born, or pr prior to their being born, in both languages. So these are the, the simultaneous bilingual children. Um, so there are three phases. In the early phase, children begin to show an understanding in both languages and can respond to what others say and make requests and commands. They might know more words in one language than another. Sorry, I've gone all over the place with my... I apologise, Isabel. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> in the middle phase, the sound system of both languages is well established and their pronunciation begins to approximate that of adults. They may begin to increase their length of utterance and engage in conversation with others. And then in the later phase, bilingual children use more complex sentences and usually have mastered the sounds of their languages. They may begin to use slang with peers. Okay. Now we're doing the musical chairs. Oh, okay, so um, if we just building on what Isabel was saying, and think of learning language as um, the home language being the foundations on which you build your house. Um, ultimately, you're building two houses. So you're going to be a bit slower if you can, you know, with the analogy of building a house. You're going to be slower building two houses, but if both are built on firm foundations, then they're going to last for generations. So um, I think what we have to remember is that um, as a child in their home language learns how to use language, how conversation works in their home language, all these skills will help them to then embed a new language learning. 
So for example, let's consider uh, we've got a child who at home is immersed in Spanish, for example, okay? And they're developing a vocabulary, but it's not just the vocabulary. So for a start, they may know that papa is the word they use for a cup, but alongside that, they've been learning the uh, how a cup works. They'll be thinking about all the various different sorts of cups that they've experienced. They know what a cup typically might look like, what it feels like, okay, and how it can be used. In effect, they're learning the cuppiness of a cup. Yeah. Regardless of what language. Regardless of what language, in their first first. home language, okay? Then, when they're surrounded in a new language, English for example, the child who's already holding the concept of what a cup is in their home language, all they're doing is learning a new label. They're not needing to learn the concept of what a cup is. They literally just need to be able to link a new word, a new label to that. Okay. So to build two good, strong languages, children need to hear them from good language models. So I suppose what we really want to emphasize is that um, parents, so the families you're supporting, really understand how important it is for them to continue to be speaking to their children in their home language every day. We'll explore that a little later. Okay, so regarding the stages of learning a new language, what are these stages? So just as a little point to note, it obviously may take a child longer to be as proficient as their peers in English if it is learned as an additional language, but the benefits are hugely vital. Is that the same for the bilingual child? as well, recognising the distinction here we're focusing on EAL as opposed to bilingualism, would it present in the same way yeah. as far as practitioners yeah. in the setting are concerned? Thank you. Yeah, and so as with their first language, children learning EAL need to learn English in context, through practical meaning experiences and through their interaction with others. So how do they learn it? So look at these stages of learning. So we've got the silent phase, which we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail in a moment, repeating and echoing, formulaic language, joining in with refrains, then they may start using the questioning words, development of independent phrases, and then eventually the longer sentences. But this can take a while, obviously, because there's a lot going on in their little heads as they're being exposed to these different stages of the language learning. Um, so many EAL children may spend a long time listening before they speak English, as anyone would learning a new language and would often, obviously, be able to understand much of what they hear um, through gesture, sign, facial expression. The more the visual support is offered and encouraged, before they can obviously start to speak the language themselves. So if we move on to the next slide, we can have a look at this silent phase in a bit more detail. So this is something that you may feel that some of the children coming into your setting will go through, but it's not a cause for concern. It's a very um, normal stage, um, and there's a lot, actually a lot of learning taking place during this time, and the children are remaining silent. It is not a passive stage of learning. So during this time, children will be watching, actively listening, exploring the environment to understand the new experiences that you're offering them, and developing meanings all the time as to the language that they're hearing. And they would also, during this time, be trying to relate previous knowledge that they've had to these new contexts and to the new language you're exposing them to. So it's really important that you don't um, encourage the children to speak and pressurise them to speak until they feel confident enough to actually do so. Um, and despite the silence from the children, it's essential though that you still continue, as it was in the first point there, to talk to the children, to pick up on their non-verbal cues and their responses, to support their understanding of meaning and to observe their interests and use resources and props in the light of those interests with them. 
So those strategies will help children to internalize the language they're hearing, develop a sense of patterns, meanings, and a range of language functions in that new, unfamiliar environment. Um, so yeah, um, it's really, really important that you are constantly using those non-verbal gestures. They will start then potentially responding to you using those non-verbal gestures as well as a response to a question or to indicate their need. So let's always remember that children will always understand far more than they can say. Okay, so if the child's mixing two languages when speaking, is this a problem? It's a question that often we hear asked. And the answer is no, it's not a problem. It's absolutely not a problem. Um, it's uh, usually a natural way of using language from a child from various different language experiences, okay? Um, it's common for children to code switch. It's not just children, it's adults and as well, okay? When they've started to access English as their second language, they'll happily switch between two languages using the most familiar and suitable word in whatever language in the context as they talk. It's a sophisticated skill, it really is. It's not muddling languages up at all. So for example, um, perhaps all of you may have been in a situation where you've gone on holiday perhaps, uh, where the language spoken isn't your own language, your home language. So I'd like us just to think about how you communicate your needs. Um, and often I've witnessed my own family members and may, dare I say it myself, <laughs> I'll start off in the host country's language and then when I've lost the words, I'll slip in the English word because I'm trying to make it make sense to me and to the person listening. So for example, um, I might be, uh, going to visit a German bakery and I might say, oh, uh, wer ist, and I'm searching for the word, uh, wer ist mein um, cake? And then as I said it, I suddenly might make that link and go, ah, oh, cushion, of course. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, so I think it's really important for you to not feel that it's um, a bad habit that the children are doing. Uh, whilst they're switching, code switching, it's actually really skillful. Okay. Point three, it's important to, to just consider as well that um, parents might be concerned that when the child is within their home environment, they may be speaking to their child in their home language, but the child might respond or choose to respond in English at home. Okay, and again, that's a very common kind of um, response for children. Um, they, they, they're taking it in and they're taking it home. So they're moving from a dominant language experience of being immersed in English within their preschool environment and then they're coming home and then as they grow confidence in English, we'll just use um, English as a response within the home environment. Um, they're not yet aware that they're separating the two languages at all. Can we move on to the next slide? So another thing to bear in mind is the length, how long it takes a child to learn English as an additional or second language, okay? Typically, it can take up to three years for a child to develop um, good enough English, okay? Um, some children will pick it up very quickly, others will take a little longer. Um, the more that children are exposed to English within your environments, the better their English language skills become, which seems such an obvious thing to say. But for some, some children, if their attendance is a bit dotty, in the sense that like they're not attending every day, um, then their progress can appear to be slower than the others and sometimes we forget about that pattern. There are many reasons sometimes that we have to think why some children's 
language acquisition of that second language is slower than others. Sorry, Sean, just the question's coming from Sarah. Um, does the three years, is that dependent on the age at which they begin? Um, is it, yes. is, is the earlier the better, or is 12 Absolutely. Well, different we're thinking from... of our, the children that we work with, um, in the sense they might be joining your nursery. If they have never been immersed in English, then that's the very beginning for them, and that would be the same for any age child who's just been immersed in one uh, language. I think Sarah's question is, do we lose the opportunity? to be fluently, bi or not fluently, effectively bilingual within three years? No, there's some really interesting research. The ability for us to learn another language and to become fluent in that other language um, is not lost. So we can, all of us, as we go on through our learning and into adult life and we want to learn a new language, we, all of us can, uh, uh, you know, become fluent within that language depending on how much we're immersed. Right. So if you're picked up by the and dropped in France and you're living in France, you're totally immersed in that language, you're going to become far more fluent in that more quickly than myself who might just attend mm -hmm. the occasional evening. But it's class. not a skill that is lost. The brain doesn't close down on it. The brain no. has the potential to learn at any point. Is there it? are some... Go ahead. No, it's about I just was going to say about um, it, it actually it does impact on speech sound development. Yes. Right. That That's what I was going to say. Yeah. You carry on there. So some wonderful research has been done by Patricia Poole, uh, K H U L, um, and she was looking at um, sort of like the linguistic genius of babies. And right. what she was discovering was that actually all of us have the potential to continue to learn language. But there is a certain cutoff period whereby our speech sound processing systems right. are kind of locked. Okay, so from babyhood up until about seven years old, we can absorb sounds as spoken so by phonics. others. You can take yeah, all the phonics. Absolutely. Whereas and you I lose would, that. So I yes. would always speak with an accent. Yes. Right. And the cutoff is generally accepted at, at seven years old. Right. So I can always learn French, but if I'm learning French after the age of seven, I will always sound like an English person because I've only got my English sounds that I can use. Okay. Does that make And that makes perfect sense. sense. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for the question. I've had another one from Megan, and I'm not sure if we're going to cover this as we go forward, but I'll, I'll raise it now and you can see whether we need to slot it in. Uh, would you consider a problem that I've experienced? Some parents may not want a constant exposure to English due to their cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Do we, we'll get to parents in due course. We do talk about parents later. We haven't got the magic wand answer for it, right. but we acknowledge that that is something that's raised an issue. Thank you, Megan. We'll come back with that in due course. Thank you. Sean. Okay. Um, sometimes, sometimes, um, Another reason why uh, children may take a little longer is that if their parents aren't feeling, in a sense it kind of reflects that question, if parents are feeling unsure, um, which we'll go on to talk about, that can impact hugely on the child's confidence. Right. But we'll explore that later. Okay, so <laughs> we come to one of our favourite images, which is the iceberg, okay, it's just to be used as an analogy because what what um, some people listening may be familiar with is um, that some children acquiring English as an additional language sometimes are referred to having basic interpersonal communication skills or BICs and it takes about two to three years for children to have that and that's when language is um, absolutely meeting the needs of day-to-day -day informal conversations. In other words, the tip of that iceberg is context embedded. So all the language I'm using is in the here and now and it has meaning and it's, it's clear to be understood because it's right in front of me, okay? I'm not having to right. reflect on anything as such. Underneath the surface, below the surface, is the kind of deeper um, understanding of language, okay, which actually 
isn't as context embedded. So that's as our children grow older and move through into uh, their further learning, they need to become proficient writers, right. etc., and have that textbook language. And that takes up to five years. So whilst you may feel a child who has English as an additional language is a very fluent chatter, are they really grasping the, the, the deeper grammatical sort of language skills necessarily? So getting that context experienced language learning from the start right makes a difference to as that child gets older. Okay, so as we've said um, on previous webinars, if, if you listen to them, it's important for us to put ourselves in the position of the child in these situations. So how might children feel, um, those children with EAL, as they arrive newly in a setting? How would we feel if we were parachuted into the middle of China or Indonesia or somewhere where we actually had to had to then just get on with life. Somebody just dumped us there or brought us along and then left us. It, it can be extremely frightening, overwhelming. Children can display all sorts of different behaviours and they will clearly feel very isolated and lost. And those are the sort of things we should learn to expect and I'm sure that all practitioners will, will try and make those children feel safe, secure, and, and wanted. And then, not forgetting, as Megan has already mentioned, if we move on to the next slide, how parents feel. Because sometimes we do forget this. Uh, we, we do focus a lot on the child, and actually the parents are the third person in this relationship. Um, and we've all been around where um, our parents who are desperate for their child, children to speak English and they put a lot of pressure on them. They try and speak English at home because they feel that's going to help the children to get a good education. Um, sometimes they think that it's actually the setting's responsibility to teach English, um, which is, it sort of is, but not to teach it in the traditional way. Uh, and they may be frightened or embarrassed about their level of ability in English. It's, re it's a really good idea if you can encourage those parents to come in to, to join in with some of the activities, maybe to, to do some dishes, to do some cooking, maybe just to read a story in their language, um, just to sort of demonstrate exactly how you embrace her language and um, if we move on to the next slide, Michael, there's another few aspects there. Um, it, it's, it's really just immersing the parents in the culture of the early years setting and, and giving them information about what is best for their children and actually showing them that, that, that actually them teaching their children in their home language at home and then leaving the, the, uh, the, the setting to be able to um, teach that child English is the best combination for the child. Um, it, it's really important that, the, I know it, oh, years gone by, parents were told to teach their children English. That was some misinformation that was given out on a regular basis to parents, and that's completely the wrong information to give. We need to be teaching parents to speak in their home language, whatever it is, because they feel proficient in that language, they feel confident, they're giving really good models of language development to their children. And as Sean was showing us earlier with the teaching of the concept of cupness, it's just about adding another label. It's not about having to learn a whole new concept for the cup. So it's it's relatively easy for children once they're exposed to English to pick those words up. And I'm thinking, just bringing that back to Megan's original question, that, that actually the parents may not want the constant exposure to English due to cultural or ethnic uh, backgrounds. 
that message is quite important in terms of the relationship between practitioners and the parent, because it, it's not a force element, it is a, a building on a real asset, being able to speak in two languages, isn't it? And Absolutely. there are EYFS requirements on the setting that any assessment, etc., should be in English, needs to be in English, but actually it's not a, a forced program. It is developing a real skill and a real effort, an asset that that child will be able to take through life going forward. Mm -hmm. So. I'm, I'm, it's not a, a magic wand answer, as, as Lindy suggested earlier, Megan, but it is that this is about the relationship between the practitioners, particularly the key person, and, and the parents, that actually building on this as an asset perspective rather than a challenge or a, a requirement. Yeah. Thank you. And all, and all parents want the best for their children, so I think if, yeah. you know, putting the messages across is the best way you know, to do that. Moving on? Yeah, okay, so here we've just got a list of things that we have considered that you might like to find out from your parents and carers um, who potentially speak other languages. So obviously the first thing you need to find out is what are those languages, which languages are spoken at home, um, and which languages the children, if they're not speaking them themselves, are being exposed to. And there can be several, as I suggested earlier on, um, some of the families that we have in South End come from incredibly multilingual backgrounds, don't they? So um, examples of language the child, un child understands and uses when at home. So um, this is really important. I'm sure a lot of you do this already, but if you can find sort of 10 to 20 key words from the parents when they start, and then obviously start learning those key words yourself. Now, these may be key words potentially that you've noticed, words that the child's be interested in. So if they're playing with the cars, you might, I don't know, say it's French, get the parent to tell you the word is voiture, so that you can learn that, for example. Um, and the more you see the children playing with those favoured toys and resources, you can build up a little list. Obviously, you can also ask parents, you know, for your daily routines, if they need toilet changing or, you know, if, if they need to be shown where to go to go to the garden outside. You may be having those um, conversations with the parent in order to establish what, which of those key words in their language. However, obviously, if English is a massive barrier for the parents themselves, you may like to think about using something, a trusted translation site. <laughs> you can try Google, but I'll talk about that in a little while. <laughs> um, but obviously, you need to share maybe a photo or take the parent to the garden or share a photo of whatever the object is with the translated word, just to double check that there is that shared understanding that is the correct terminology. Um, sometimes as well, when we have um, children that speak a language where the alphabet isn't phonetically recognised as it would be in English, obviously if, a, if you're hearing a word translated and you've established that is the correct word, but the symbolic representation of the word is going to be difficult for a, an English practitioner to understand, then obviously have a go at writing it down phonetically. It doesn't actually matter if it's spelling the word correctly as long as you are using your English correctly to pronunciate uh, the word in the correct way. Um, again, I've mentioned about using photos, using concrete items to get the word translated. Um, well, just generally, this way of, of using this approach and um, learning some of the child's um, words will create a, a shared language and actually it also puts you into that position of learning the language and makes the child the expert, which is something they may be lacking confidence-wise. Um, so that can really help their emotional well-being as not only are you showing them and their parents that you're valuing their language, but you're modelling that it's okay to try things out as you learn. And I'm sure you might get some funny looks sometimes when you're trying to say some of the words in their language, but you're showing that you are trying. Next slide. Right then, so some practical ways in which we can um, support parents, carers and children um, in and around our early learning environments. One of the most frequent things is that you will have greetings and welcome signs in different home languages, which is wonderful, but sometimes they're rather generic and Personally, I've seen them where really they're just token gestures where possibly the script of the word for hello 
um, is totally unrecognisable to the word as it sounds. So um, one of the suggestions that we would really kind of emphasise is that you start to reflect the languages of your community. With it doesn't necessarily mean that those children are already at your setting, but what it means is that when that family comes to visit and join and view and decide that they want to come, they are already seeing the language, their home language being reflected. So um, learning to be able to say hello in various different languages is far more powerful than having a picture up uh, welcoming people, I think, personally. Um, it's also, obviously, it's wonderful to be able to, as a parent with a different language, to see my language written and celebrated as well. Uh, using lots of photo books and photographs to illustrate timetables and um, uh, first and then and next and where things are. Um, pictures on resources is really helpful for our children because they start to link obviously the activity and the play and the resource with that word that they keep hearing as they play with it. Um, words around the room, and by words around the room we do mean words in other languages, uh, in the home languages around that surround your children. Um, but also to remember not just words but the objects as well from different cultures from so that all of your community is being reflected in the play opportunities particularly in the role play making sure that within your supermarkets you're pulling out the uh, and packaging that represents those different communities as well um referencing lindsay's um earlier point about learning the languages and, and what you've said about the words around the room i can't resist the opportunity to say that the Alliance's Somerset English as an Additional Language Project have developed a series of flashcards and keywords yeah. in about 20 different languages, yeah. which, which yeah. have the phonetics in them as well, available um, through all good bookshops, not actually not, through the Alliance's website and the Southwest Service Hub. Um, and I think recently priced at £7.50. Oh, I'll move on quickly. I'm not normally allowed to do that. There we go. There we go. I'm putting you in. Okay. So, ways in which you can help a child to speak in English. So, I'm sure you all do this already. Um, so, obviously, with every child, you're hopefully using very positive body language, smiling a lot, using lots of lovely facial expressions. And the other thing you are hopefully doing is focusing activities around what the child likes. I've already said this, but I think the part involved, which I'm not going to read out to you, is pretty obvious. Um, regarding the third point on there, gaining the child's attention before addressing them, please can remember to wait for the child to actually look at you and face watch. That's something that we are starting to do a little bit of work on in South End at the moment. It's much more important that we don't just focus on the eye contact, but we're ensuring that the child is actually watching our face and that we're watching theirs. Can you explain that in a bit more detail? Because when you said about the eyes, that's the obvious thing that we normally do when we're addressing somebody. What's the difference between focusing somebody's eyes and focusing on the because face? Because the face actually gives away a lot more of those non-verbal um, key communication, right. I don't know, ideas. No, that's right. Yeah. So um, there's something called verb, um, which I've forgotten the lady's name. Keena. Keena Cummings. Keena Cummings. If anyone wants to look some more information on that verb, B-E-R-B-E. -E. Um, she's a speech and language therapist and we've received a little bit of training from her in South End. So if anyone's interested in that, please contact us. There's my plug. <laughs> <laughs> we don't charge. Um, so yes, but please make sure that you are gaining the child's attention before you address them. Uh, and Sharon has made a comment there. In some cultures, it's considered bad manners for a child uh, child to look an adult in the eyes. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, they can be. So we so, have to be very careful of the different nuances of the cultures of the children. Um, and the final point, I'm sure you're aware of this one, but it can be up to 10 seconds. Um, so don't keep rephrasing and you know, re rephrasing over and over and over until you're sure that the child has really has understood you. And obviously, you can then take the child to what it is you're trying to explain or show pictures, as I have mentioned before. Um, Zoe has offered a comment, and I'd like you to try and reflect on it to explain it to me. 
Um, we can find that boys with EAL find it easier to play with non-verbal cues and single words, whereas girls find it harder to play and interact with peers. Is that something that... Um, uh, if, if, if Zoe wants to elaborate on that side, yeah, it's something interesting, um, interesting comment. Mm. And again, that whole issue of gender specifics in terms of what motivates um, different would be one to explore. Mm. And whether that's particular EAL or whether that's just boys and girls yeah, generally. It's just being linked to boys needing to be absolutely in the moment with their play. So that in a sense the language they develop is often just a commentary. Yeah. So quite often it's the sound like this as they said the dinosaur, you know, that kind yes. of thing. Whereas possibly when um, gender, I'm thinking of gender play here, but maybe that kind of narrative is not quite so frequently okay. used within Thank you. Play. Interesting point, Zoe. Thank you. Interesting. Mm. Um, the next slide is a little bit more advanced in the same. So we've talked about the pointing, gesture, visual support, and so on, alongside their spoken instruction. Repetition, obviously. Allowing the child to have solitary play is a bit like the silent phase in a way, but what you've got to ensure is that within your provision, you are creating spaces where small spaces where a child can actually sit and observe uninterrupted and that's okay for them to do that mm. without people constantly bombarding them or going up to them are you okay are you okay come over here play with this play with that sometimes they just need that space as we know all children need um, but particularly in the AL child when they're just trying to take it all in and have a little bit of time to play on their own that's absolutely fine um, I won't read through the rest. I think they're pretty Do you want to expand on use visual with verbal, talk while doing? Just, I mean, it's probably self explanatory. Yeah, but... I think so. So if you're sitting there and the child is observing you making something with the Play Doh, you're explaining that you are playing with Play Doh. But if you keep the language really simple, you won't right. start Thank expanding you. into too many options because otherwise it gets confusing. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so. This is actually just wanted to really focus on the importance of stories. If you go on to the next picture, okay, because they're an amazing way of um, enabling children acquire their additional language through sharing stories, okay? So, um, story sessions bring such pleasure and enjoyment, and they really help to develop children's imagination. And as you are sharing a story with a child, often they may, their attention may be drawn to a part of the picture. And that's a wonderful clue straight away to that adult as to what's interesting to that little one. Sometimes you might actually not go on to read the whole story because you're just talking about what is interesting to that little one on that page. Okay, so it might be that they're pointing to the tree and you're talking about the tree. It's a tree, naming the tree, talking about all the other context that's happening in that picture. To really help children with uh, English as an additional language, choosing stories with a clear storyline uh, who are being written in a direct, simple language where there's repetitive text. They're particularly useful because it also helps children to chunk language so that they remember a whole chunk of, of a rhyme or of a story. Um, and then later, as they become more familiar, can separate that chunk into different words and use those different words in a variety of different contexts. But being able to sort of hold on to that little refrain and repeat it really, really helps them. Um, the other is not to forget that some of your children, and this is true for all children, whilst you're sharing a story, may not actually have had that experience that is being described. So the link between the story experience and the concrete play experience is hugely important. It's that talk and do that Lindsay was talking about earlier. Um, so they can feel the graph so that they understand what squishy squashy really means, what squelch really means when they put their foot into a muddy substance, a muddy puddle. So those first-hand experiences cannot be emphasised enough. And then finally, dual language books. So there are many now, and there are many places that we can access them through our libraries, 
um, through, um, if you go onto Bookstar, the Book Trust's website, um, they have got how to share a book in a multiple different languages, up to 20 different languages. So you can share those key messages with parents as well. Um, dual language books are brilliant to support parents who, as we mentioned before, are maybe being not confident enough to share a story in English. They can do so using their dual textbook, but also celebrate their own language to go back. I think it was Megan's point, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Parents not necessarily wanting English to be all per, 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 per. <laughs> <laughs> pervasive. Oh, That's the word. Pervasive. Okay, not easy to find. Um, Mantra Lingua is also very useful in being able to access dual texts. Um, and there are lots of other places uh, that you can find that now too. Okay, so. Um, for those parents who are finding it English maybe to, uh, finding English difficult to understand, how do we actually get key messages across to them? So one of the easiest, I think, um, most impactful ways is by filming key messages, um, and that way they're not relying on text or on English because the film is the stimulus itself. So in other words, I might film their little one playing with something, and then they watch the film, and then I'm able to give them that little resource to then take home and clearly understand what the message is, how they would like their little one to, have, what the expectation is, to how to play with that resource within their home. Okay. Um, similarly, photographs. Uh, can be used to capture the activities that children have been engaging in. You can use them also to illustrate the routine that you're, you're wanting parents to understand. So in other words, if you know that you need certain resources or things from home in a bag, you take pictures of what we expect to be in the homeschool link bag. And then they know exactly, ah, oh, I want to spare me, please spare this, spare that. Okay. Okay, and then finally, lots of photos, making photo books, choosing pictures, um, making them on, on a plume. You were talking about your uh, sunset team who created a lanyard with visual prompts as well. Um, what we've got to remember though is that we don't create <laughs> such heavy lanyards that we knock the children <laughs> unconscious as we would swing past them. But uh, with photos, you know real ownership from the children they love to look and also keeping photo books from previous years because the children are fascinated to see other children like themselves being represented uh, within their prior communities okay and um, so there are lots of different websites out there now that tr translate key messages for us from english into a wide variety of languages but this is just a, an indication of, of something that's been put on here from the um, input website. Um, you can see on the left there we've got the language pyramid that's kind of been tucked into it for some strange reason <laughs> in the diagram. Um, and then it's been translated on the right hand side. I can't actually remember what language that's been translated into. I must say, I think it might be Bulgarian, but I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, if anybody out there knows, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> check something that we need a letter that we wanted to go out with some very important key messages about literacy skills and literacy learning and um, we asked a native speaker to check it once Google had translated it and they laughed at us because they think it's quite a gobbledygook it makes absolutely no sense at all so do please be careful and for those of you that want to see any more of the input website it's actually referenced at the back at the end of this um, so actually having those good relations with either the parent or yeah, other yeah, native yeah, speakers yeah. around the setting is essential because otherwise you could yeah. end up really Absolutely. You know. you could really yeah, get yourself into a bit of trouble. So um, if you have the capacity and resource and, that, um, and you do know some of those parents really, really well, um, what you might like them to do is actually do a little bit of filming for you um, regarding key messages um, and then they can be shared with other native speakers of the same language. 
Now, obviously, we put on there that you could enlist the services of a professional translator, but I don't think many people out there have got the funding to do that. Um, facility. So, um, if you can um, really befriend those um, parents that you feel can be trusted um, and you've engaged with well, then you know that's a really key thing. Um, so, to end today's session, we'll show you a little clip of somebody from Southend who is speaking in Ukrainian. Um, sharing the importance of um, books and reading books for children. We'll see if Lindsay's confidence in the technology um, is merited. Here we go. Uh, I've got the wheel of doom. Okay. Hello, my name is Ganna Turner and I come from Ukraine. Dilitisa istoriya. Molodei mozot kovinen gutuvatisa tak samo jak i butinok. Dilitisa istoriya duže vašlivo Tak jak chce, dopomoże młodemu mózgu rosty i rozwiewaty się. Jakimi historiami wy dzielitys? Kaskie te historie wykorzystujące nie tylko przed snem. Ty możesz podzielić się historią z dziećmi w любой czas. To może być z powodu z minulego, albo ujawnienie ważnej historii. Thank you. Um, it's, so it's not so much about the content there, it's more about the fact that this was a parent or a member of the community who you got to know and was able to... Absolutely, yeah. Um, Sharon has just said, don't think it was See? Bulgarian, yeah. may have been Lithuanian. We have a language ah. identification chart on our website. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right, um, anything, uh, sorry, just final slide, I think. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, references and resources, anything to which you particularly draw our attention? I'd say that the ePUT website's very good for lots of different languages there. As Sean recommended earlier, Mantralingua. Oh, no, yeah. What yeah, is uh, Mantralingua? Uh, it's yeah. a classic that produce lovely children's picture books in dual texts. Okay, thank you. Um, right, um, it's been fascinating. Thank you all, as ever. Um, I will just witter on for about 15, 20 seconds, just to see if there are any other questions or comments that come in from colleagues um, still with us, um, just to see if there are any other factors. The other thing to bear in mind is the last of our series of webinars will be on, oh, there's another slide you're telling me, uh, will be on the 4th of December, um, where we're looking at speech language communication, parental engagement, the home learning environment, and smooth transitions. All in 35 so, minutes. Yeah. Are, you, are you sure? Um, right. Okay. But please do put it in your diary. What isn't there is the time. Um, we will usually try and do our, the situation of four till five. Um, can you please repeat what the flashcards will call and when these are available? Please. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, available through the Alliance, on the Alliance's website, you will get contact details of our Southwest Hub. There is a we have an EAL project in Somerset. All the details will be on the website uh, and will be available directly through them. Uh, details on the Alliance's website. Thank you. Um, if that is our final point, it just remains for me as ever to say thanks to Lindsay, Sean and Isabel um, and to thank you all for your participation today. Enjoy the rest of your evening.